got there on the first day, sat down, and I was like, shit. I've just, I've just studied for years. I've spent a fuckload of money, and now I fucking hate it. What now? What do I do next? Hello, Heidi. Hi. Thanks to you for coming in today. Pleasure. Do you want to tell me a little bit about yourself? Sure. I'm Eddie Whittingham, originally from a particularly grim part of uh, England called Scunthorpe. What are you working on right now? So I sold my business two years ago. Um, since then, I've been working on GoFounder. So the idea behind that is to try and give people what I wished I'd had when I started. So community of the founders, where you can learn from resources to actually learn from. I'm also working on a DTC baby grow business, mm -hmm. which is about six months in. So we'll be looking to raise later this year. And um, I've also bought an old church. Oh, wow. Seemed like a good idea at the time. But converting that into a co-working space and private office space. What would you say are your strengths and your weaknesses? Oh, you should probably ask my missus that option. Mm -hmm. uh, strengths, I'm a people pleaser. Probably where I thrive and I like to think I can get the best out of other people. I'd probably say I've got like a relatively high kind of emotional intelligence. And then weaknesses, I would probably say I jump into things quite quickly so I don't always think them through. Like buying a church. Like buying a church mm -hmm. and then figuring out how it's going to work later. Have you ever been fired? Only, no, only from like paper round when I was oh. a nipper. But no, nothing, no, not being fired, thankfully, not to do it. What about you? No, I do get fired. Yeah. Have you ever had to fire people? I've had to fire one person. Um, was it hard? It was a knob. But, oh, okay. But it still wasn't a nice process to go through. He was studying in, a, in cybersecurity, I had a cybersecurity business. He mm -hmm. was studying that part time, so Thursday, Friday mornings, he was going to be out of the office doing, doing his studies. So I said, well, I'll pay a full time wage because mm -hmm. I think his studies are going to be relevant, so we'll just call it even because I think that's long term really good. Um, but then he turned up late on his first day, turned up late on his second day. Took about two and a half hours of lunch one day, left early without telling me another day, then rang in sick for two weeks, and then came back, just was the shit, it's like, it's fine. But yeah, it didn't feel good, like it's horrible. It's either though when someone doesn't perform. Yeah, I think it, it's probably worse when they're like borderline not performing, whereas he kind of made it quite easy for me. Did you have like a leadership position in the past, and uh, what do you think uh, are the qualities that a good leader would uh, need? I think for me, all I tried to do was like look back at good managers and bad managers and mm. pull the best bits. So for me, the good stuff was giving people autonomy, being really relaxed with them, trusting them. Um, kind of my motto has always been, I will trust someone 100% until you, until you break it. I'll give you all my trust, but if you break it, that's it. You're out, you're out of the picture. What are you more passionate about, obviously, besides your daughter and your family and everything? I'm, I love business. I, I'm from a very normal working class family. No one was in business, didn't know anyone in business at the time. And I probably came to business a bit later, so I didn't start my business till I was 30. Yeah, I think that's why we created uh, the actual serial, serial brand uh, called Entrepreneurial. What do you think of the guy in the box? If you have to describe him in three words, what would you say? <laughs> Intelligent, privileged narcissist. And if you had to choose another representative, another person in the box? There's plenty of those. Oh, really? Uh, who's worthy of being on the box? Yeah, who's worthy of being on the box? That would be the question. The thing that annoys me about most kind of entrepreneurs is they all have a backstory, and most backstories are full of shit. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see some bloke on there who's just built a business isn't chasing the limelight, mm -hmm. isn't, isn't a bell end, and doesn't have a fake backstory. What do you think we should use uh, as a catchphrase in the box? Uh, your 5 a.m. cereal. Oh, nice. Because you've got to get up at 5 a.m. to be successful, as oh. we all know. Tell me about the time that you made uh, a mistake. Um, when I grew up, it was kind of, uh, call it like the happy family pack of card game, where you can be a doctor, a butcher, a gardener, a postman, mm -hmm. and I chose policeman, so that's what I became. Mm -hmm. And the logical next step for me, I thought, because I didn't know a route out of that, was to go into law, because it was obviously something that I'd done, 
it was a respected job, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. But I kind of pursued it anyway, because I was like, it was the only route out of my situation, I thought at the time. In hindsight, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, but, but studied for years to get there. I've gotten about £25,000 personal debt, because I wasn't eligible for student funding. Mm -hmm. And then literally, like I said uh, earlier on, got there on the first day, sat down, and I was like, shit. I've just, I've just studied for years. I've spent a fuckload of money. I've told everyone I'm gonna go be a big shot lawyer and now I fucking hate it. What now? What do I do next? I probably knew deep down I wasn't gonna enjoy it, but I felt like society would probably think it was a good thing to do and all that sort of bullshit. But do you think it, um, it helped you in some way? Probably a bit. Like if you'd have taken me out of scum bob in the police mm -hmm. to try to run a startup and then speaking to some of the big players when you're trying to sell to them and stuff and gonna do the meetings, my ass was probably falling out. And I probably almost got me over a little bit of imposter syndrome because obviously some exceptionally talented and intelligent people working there. But I probably held them up on a pedestal before I joined it. And then when I got there, I was like, yeah, I could do this. Like. So the team did a background check. I mean, I'm speaking like um, yeah. what is that now? I start sweating. <laughs> You're speaking a bit about, about this before, but yeah, that's basically you, right? How did you decide to become a uh, policeman? I think I probably didn't appreciate what other opportunities there were at the time. Like, I, I didn't probably appreciate at the time that there were jobs like copywriting and all, yeah. sort of, all the creative stuff that I probably was more aligned with. Um, so, I, yeah, it just seemed like a, something I'd enjoy, something different every day, good career, as, as the tra tradition goes, uh, good pension that you should definitely be thinking about when you're 18 years old. It was, it was a relatively good fit for me as well. Like I was, I and how long were you in the police force? So nine and a bit years. Nine years in the police force. What's the crazy thing that happened? Uh, the, probably the most harrowing thing was uh, there was a 999 call came in for a person who'd been stabbed. And we were on, we were literally, me and my colleague who, who hadn't been in very long, we were on the exact road. We were probably like you know, half a mile away. So we got there, uh, and we got there, and the guy had been stabbed in the neck with a pair of scissors, and he was still sort of on his feet, stumbling around. Blood was just... Spear. It's, yeah, mm -hmm. just firing out his neck. So I managed to get this guy on the floor, applying pressure to his neck to stem the bleeding, obviously. Um, and then, he, yeah, he died. Oh, he died. Nice. Uh, yeah, like sort of last breaths with me, unfortunately, bless him. Um, he, he turns out he wasn't a particularly nice person, so I'm, I'm, I'm not harrowed by him being dead, mm -hmm. but it was still a horrific. Did he stay with you through the years, this moment? Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Like, like it took a while. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they, nine years is long enough in a place where you see enough bad shit. So you see a lot of car accidents, you see, uh, I've seen probably, I don't know, over, at least over 50 dead people, probably more. Mm -hmm. Some in really peaceful circumstances, some in funny circumstances, ho ho horrible as that sounds, mm -hmm. um, and, and some in really harrowing, horrific circumstances that, yeah, mm -hmm. they kind of live with you, but you just kind of box it off a little bit. That's probably, there's probably some psychologist going to watch this and say, you need to get some help, mate. This is a photo of you and your heart. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. the blue beast. Yeah. Yeah, that was back in the early days. So when I first started the business, mm. it was called uh, the world's shittest name, I should add, was Business Fraud Prevention Partnership. I was just on my ass. Like me and my missus, we'd got that car from my mum. It's a sort of 500 pound banger. I had to drive that everywhere. My first employee, God bless her, even came round uh, to meet meetings in that car oh. with me. But we used to park it round the corner from stuff. So I went to this insurance company about doing this partnership and I thought, this is like a decent opportunity. Parked the car, they had a massive car park, got a pass from her, put it in the car, went to a meeting, came down from the meeting, and then the guy who had the meeting was like, oh, I need to get a pass out of your car. I was like, it's all right, I'll just go out and get it. Don't you worry, I'll go out and get it. So like, no, no, I'll come with you. So literally went outside, our reception, my car's there, they fucking like opened the door. <laughs> Hand him the pass. Okay, see you later. I never heard from him again. Times have changed now, I guess. Probably. Business. I would be asked personally, because yeah. just because you're driving a shithole doesn't mean you've not got a good business, but it made me feel a proper cunt. Forgive you £40,000. 
What would you start? If I, if I was in my position I'm in now, where I could take higher risk, I'd probably put it into crypto. Holy shit, seriously? Only because I'm in a position where like a high risk investment mm. wouldn't be that crazy yeah. for me. My crypto? Uh, I, think there, I think there's still a long way to go with that. Do you really think the technology or...? I, I still think it's a lot of bollocks. But I'm mm. trying to understand why I think it's bollocks and why other people don't. If you had £2,000, how would you be able to double it in 24 hours? I would take it and go around... This sounds really naff, but bear with me. I'd go around like charity shops Mm -hmm. So, the shit you can find there, mm -hmm. and you could like, you know, a pair of nearly new Converse for five quid. Mm -hmm. So, if, if I had two grand, I'm pretty confident if I just did a couple of days going around, well, you gave me 24 hours, didn't you? 24 hours going around all the charity shops in Manchester, I'm pretty sure I'd clean up there. And then sell it. And then sell it, yeah. On, on, it. on eBay. eBay, yeah. On eBay. It'd have to be a quick sale like, for 24 hours. On eBay, yeah. What makes you the best candidate for the job to take over entrepreneurs? Well, I'm your guy if you want to take it and retain equity and bootstrap it mm -hmm. and scale it without bullshit yes. and making it a serial for the people. Mm -hmm. But if you want a flash Harry who's going to attract all the investment mm -hmm. and put a narcissist on the box, then I'm not your guy. Do you believe more in bootstrapping or raising funds? No, nah, I, I, I used to be very bootstrap pro mm -hmm. on the basis that I'd done it. And I was part of an accelerator program where they really rammed investment down your throat, like in a negative way. Mm -hmm. But then I've got a business now, um, our DTC business, where we're going to have to get investment to scale it. Yes. So it depends what business you're at. I think, I think way too many people think they need investment when actually they don't. Mm. Um, because they've watched too much Dragon's Den on the telly or Shark Tank or whatever it's called. So this is uh, one thing that we do again and uh, it's a task. And I'm gonna time you. Sure. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, let's try that. Okay, yeah. My dads. I think I have dads. Well, this will prove to anyone like anyone can actually start and build a business because I can't do this. <laughs> Whereas my like two and a half year old probably could do it in about ten seconds. Mm -hmm. I'm still. I can't do it. Check the links in the description to learn more about Pop Up. Hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. How did the interview go? I think the interview went all right. Some weird questions in there, but I think I did all right. What did you think of Matteo himself and his whole business? The, uh, yeah, the Cheerios rip-off business. Uh, yeah, it's got potential. Not sure about the uh, CEO, but we'll see. And could you see yourself working in there in the next year or so? Yeah, why not? If my life takes a deep, dark spiral, why not? <laughs> Brilliant. Cheers for coming, mate. Thank you.